thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Doma and I'll be in the background answering all of your technical questions today. So if you experience any technical difficulties during your session, uh, please use the Q&A panel found on the lower right hand of your screen to request assistance. So now I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Steve. Uh, Steve, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Steve Saxon. I'm a partner based in Shenzhen, China, and I lead McKinsey's travel work across Asia. In today's webinar, we're going to be sharing the results from our recent latest survey on the Chinese traveler and draw some implications from that for global markets as well. However, um, at this time, it's important to remember that first and foremost, COVID-19 is a humanitarian crisis. We're today talking about restarting tourism, but this is a time of continued crisis. There are continued to be tens of thousands of deaths and millions of people are losing their livelihoods. Our priority as a firm is in supporting the front line in battling against the virus and to help the um, help preserve and maintain people's livelihoods. Getting tourism restarted is key to protecting millions of jobs and millions of livelihoods around the world. And so restarting tourism in a, in a responsible way um, is key to getting the economy restarted as well. There will be time for Q&A today. Um, to protect confidentiality, all the participants on this are anonymous and you are muted. However, we do um, really want to hear from you. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you will see a Q&A panel. Um, click on that and you can type some questions and we will cover those towards the end of the, of, of the webinar. The, the questions will be confidential, so we won't attribute them to either you or your organization. So I'm joined today by the three authors of our recent article. Will Enger, who is a partner in Hong Kong, Jackie Yu, who is an associate partner based in Hong Kong, and Valky Wang, who is a consultant in our Shanghai office. They will take us through the findings from the report and look forward to taking your Q&A afterwards. Thank you. With that, I'll pass to Valky as our first presenter. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Valky from Shanghai office, and uh, it's a great honor to introduce this report to everyone. Um, so here I will start by introducing the Chinese tourism market, especially uh, on the recent travel demand recovery um, in, uh, during the holiday season and previous season. Um, so first, if we look at the uh, China tourism market before the COVID uh, crisis, overall China, the China tourism market has already received significant attention and taking a leading position of the, in terms of market size and other metrics globally. If we look at the outbound tourism market, we can see that China is leading in terms of its uh, tourist, uh, outbound tourism market size um, and has almost 170 million tours um, in 2019 alone. And aside from its really great size, um, uh, we can also see that um, China is actually leading in terms of the growth, uh, growth speed uh, of its outbound tourism market um, among the top 10 markets. Um, aside from the outbound tourism, uh, China is also leading in terms of the uh, domestic um, tourism market size and is also the core uh, source market for a lot of uh, global top destinations, such as um, the ones in Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam, Thailand, um, and for uh, your, the European destinations in some countries, China's tourist groups might be the largest um, uh, in, in, in terms of size among the major Asian countries. And moving on to the next slide, uh, we can see that China um, uh, is ex expected to recover after COVID um, overall as soon as 2022. So this slide shows that our, um, uh, uh, our result from the M MGI um, monitoring the major countries' recovery in terms of the tourism market Overall, the recovery uh, of China's uh, tourism market has dipped, um, uh, has shown a dip uh, right after the COVID crisis, uh, but we expect to see a recovery back to 
the uh, pre-COVID uh, the, the pre COVID um, period by 2022. And if we only look at the domestic uh, size of the domestic market, uh, we can see that um, the size of domestic market will be able to recover around um, 2009, uh, around 2021, um, approaching the level similar to 2019. Um, this is mainly driven by uh, the uh, attractiveness of the domestic market, as well as the strong ec economic growth um, uh, uh, even after the uh, COVID crisis. And for as for the outbound recovery, um, we will likely see a, a slower um, recovery compared to the domestic market. So the recovery will um, be completed, uh, expected to be 2000, uh, around 2024 and 2025. And this is highly dependent on the vaccine penetration as well as the uh, inter-country travel arrangement among the countries. And moving on to the next slide. Um, we can see that China's consumers in general has um, more um, confidence in terms of economy recovery after uh, COVID-19 and uh, compared with the major countries around the world. And um, this is a major indicator shows uh, showing that um, uh, the Chinese consumers is going to have more confidence um, in the future uh, state of uh, uh, activity recovery, especially when the uh, recovery of the economy generally translates to discretionary spending and, uh, that flows to tourism spending. And it, yeah, so for, um, as we just look at the uh, actual recovery data from the Chinese market, we can see that there are three sides of travel and logistics recovery in China. So um, uh, in terms of the logistics, a very interesting thing to see, uh, to see is that um, there has been prominent growth um, since January in terms of the express shipment. This is mainly driven by the online, the, the rise of online e-commerce um, based on the daily needs of the consumers, as well as the accelerated penetration of the uh, digital um, uh, of the digital marketing channels, as well as online online shopping. Um, and if we look at the uh, indicators related to the domestic travel, such as um, domestic air pass number of domestic air passengers and rail railway passengers, um, as well as the hotel room nights, we can see that um, even though these indicators has uh, dropped significantly around the uh, onset of COVID-19. Uh, it has steadily recovered from the dip um, from um, since February and is healthily picking up uh, the growth, uh, approaching a similar level uh, compared to 2019. And um, in, um, in comparison with the logistics and the domestic travel related indexes, um, if we look at the international um, related indexes, such as the international air passengers and numbers of uh, uh, cruise passengers, we can see that um, due to the strict travel ban um, in China, this uh, recovery um, related to international travel has been uh, almost frozen since the onset of uh, COVID-19. And um, uh, the recovery will be highly dependent upon the actual um, global recovery um, from the COVID-19 as well as the arrangement among countries. And moving on to the, um, uh, the most recent development in, uh, in China during the Golden Week, as we just had an eight-day holiday um, uh, since the start of October, uh, we can see that um, overall the uh, tourism and airline industries has witnessed a very strong rebound. And uh, in terms of this um, size of the tourism market, we can see that um, we can see a lot of uh, positive signs, um, such as 80% um, uh, recovery in terms of the uh, volume of tourism and 70 uh, and a recovery to 70% of uh, tourist spending in uh, in China. And by sectors, there are several um, winners um, in the markets as well. Uh, so first, if we look at the uh, airlines, um, 
we can see that um, domestically the uh, passenger a number of fairway passengers has recovered to almost the same level as uh, 2019 and uh, uh, especially when we look at the domestic flights it's actually having a higher uh, capacity compared to 2019 almost by 13 percent and if we look at the uh, hotel segment it's interesting to see that um, not only has the volume recovered to a very similar level as 2019 um, but also we can see that um, the premium hotels, uh, especially four-star and five-star hotels, are receiving uh, a lot more attention compared to um, previous years. Um, uh, the numbers might be around 30 to 40 percent. So um, the interest of the premium spending in hotel is actually pretty significant. And um, if we look at destinations, the tourists are generally more interested in uh, traveling locally or in surrounding areas. Um, this is still um, a trend um, com uh, compared uh, with the uh, pre-COVID. Um, but we are also seeing indicators that long-haul um, travel is coming back. Um, so um, related to the destinations, there are um, several um, categories of interesting um, uh, uh, activities such as duty-free shopping and car rental. So especially if we look at um, Hainan and Sanya, uh, we can see that um, these um, destinations um, are receiving a lot of um, popul uh, popularity related to uh, duty-free shopping with Hainan um, uh, witnessing over uh, around 50% of increase in duty-free um, in duty-free shopping income um, after the policy around June for uh, benefiting the uh, duty-free uh, industry in Hainan. And in terms of car rental, we can also see that in Sanya, there's an increase in terms of uh, car rental volume by over 60% in uh, compared to 2019 level. So um, overall, the confidence level um, of domestic travel um, is showing a very strong um, a strong recovery. And um, next, I will pass to Will to go over um, more detailed uh, consumer sentiment uh, results and share the latest insight from China's survey um, ahead of the holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Valky. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Uh, my name again is Will. I'm a partner in the Hong Kong office, and I'll talk you briefly through some of our survey data. To better understand the underlying consumer sentiment that sits underneath some of the trends Valky was just discussing, we've been conducting several rounds of survey and direct customer research in China, um, beginning back in August at the sort of beginning of the recovery period. Um, as you can see on the page, we have done our best to spread this research or spread the data collection out across age, region, income level, and travel experience with all of most of our, our selected uh, respondents having traveled domestically or outbound within the last two years. So we think we have a very good representative set that we've sampled three times now, approximately 9,000 people in total. Um, so I'll cover some of the select insights on these today in these pages. The full report can be seen on McKinsey.com. Jackie will talk about that later where you can find that. So if we move to our next page, I think the first thing to highlight here is that the Sentiment has improved dramatically in mainland China over the last several months. The way to read this chart is the dark blue uh, across these different travel categories. There's the average score, sentiment score, back in May, when we asked people in April how they thought this would develop in May. And the lighter blue is the current sentiment score, when we asked people in September, excuse me, in August, how they thought they would feel in September. High on the chart, five, is a, an assessment that it's completely safe to travel again, while the one means Absolutely, under no circumstances do I feel safe traveling um, and won't do it. Uh, so what you see if you look at sort of the dark blue versus the light blue, um, even back at the beginning of the recovery in May, June timeframe, working locally was assessed to be relatively safe. Not a five, not fully recovered, but fairly, fairly well recovered out of four. If you looked at the domestic business, however, or of course outbound, you saw a much different and dramatic change between May and June, where we're at now with a 3.7. Um, on domestic business travels, uh, travel. So you see, even for local, for short distance, for long distance, you see dramatic increases between the dark blue and the light blue bars, indicating a return of consumer of confidence. Now, of course, we recognize that the top of this bar is not at a five. 
Um, so we know that, you know, we are still in a new normal or a normal that is evolving, but this is a dramatic improvement over where we were several months ago. One last thing to highlight on this page, we do see, of course, outbound, um, as you would expect, continues to lag the rest of uh, the improvements on the domestic and the local travel. Um, we would expect that would not change until, you know, more customer or consumers had actual experience travel outbound or new people, one or two degrees of separation that had traveled in the regulatory environment had changed enough in order to make that possible. So if we move to the next page, um, we also asked traveler sentiments, when do you think you're going to travel again? And we've asked this question three times over the course of the year, and the, rem the results have been remarkably consistent. Um, national holiday has, has, since April, has continued to be the most important holiday that the travelers have talked about taking a trip on. Uh, I think the nice thing about our most recent survey and the actuals in October is marketeers often get asked, well, sentiment is great, but do we see the actual traveler behavior or the customer behavior following through? Uh, I think what we see here very clearly is that the travel sentiment uh, has followed through with actual behavior, booking behavior and travel behavior in the October holiday that we recently had. This question, again, was asked back in August. So if we predict that forward, we look at through the end of the year, into new year, and into next spring, we would expect these percentages to remain at or where they are and follow through into the behavior. If you look at the right-hand side of the page, one thing we have noticed, while the top-line number has remained remarkably consistent, the kinds of people answering the question in the positive have changed over time. Back in April, when we first started answering this question, the people that said, yes, definitely I'm going to travel now were younger, 25 to 34, were single, middle class, essentially the demographic you would expect to be first back into the market. Now, towards the end of the year, we see a much broader uh, segment of people across the spectrum now answering that question positively and saying, I expect to travel. We now have the elders back in the boat, the 55 to 64-year-old group, and retire as well as retirees. So again, I think uh, another indicator that sentiment, broad-based sentiment for travelers has started to recover in the mainland. If we move to the next page. What do we see in terms of uh, desired trips, or what do people want to do when they travel? Uh, we've asked a couple different ways, this question a couple different ways to try to understand what's new and different now versus what used to be. Um, and we've also checked this question linearly over time. As I mentioned, we've administered this survey a couple of times since, since April. Uh, what's interesting is that, I guess, the, the trends remain the same regardless of when we ask the question and the trends remain fairly strong. So our expectation would be that going forward over the next six to 12 months that these trends would continue. Uh, they are unexpectedly food, natural landscape, beach, and family. So you, know, you could read this as these are the kinds of trips that put people in less crowded places, in outdoor places, in places that may be perceived to have less risk of virus transmission or be safer. I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor. I have no idea if, if a natural landscape tour is in fact safer than a shopping tour, but we do see people seeming to believe that this is the direction that they want to go. If you move to the next page, this is a, this is a bit of a compare and contrast page. So we do see um, in, in that previous page talked about destinations. This page talks about tours and how people want to get to where they want to go. So if you look at the left-hand side of the page, the way to read this chart is dark blues are people that would say definitely yes to the question of would you take a self-guided tour, and the lighter blue are people that are falling into the maybe bucket. Still positive, but not a no. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see the same set of questions for group and tour and for crews. And so if you look at the left-hand side of the page, we see definitely a lot more support, again, for things that we'd be perceived potentially as safer. Do-it-yourself touring, Road trips continue to outscore, and that trend has been remarkably consistent between May and August. If you look at the numbers across the bottom of the page, which is the sum of the two bubbles. Um, not surprisingly, crews, given all of the media attention and some of the challenges that the cruise ships have had, uh, is not popular. Uh, it still scores relatively low, but that number is starting to slowly creep up. From May, it was at about a 9% across the two together. Now is at 12. So the expectation of the hope would be for a recovery across all of these travel types, but perhaps the speed of the recovery will be a bit different if you read this page left to right, with crews and things on the right-hand side of the page recovering a bit slower than things on the left-hand side of the page. So if we move to the next page, another question that we asked our respondents was where they wanted to go first when they, were, when they had the opportunity to travel again. And what we found was a bit surprising. We expected to see domestic travel within China being the most popular option by a wide margin. 
it is popular, but we also still see a large number of people, 31% in August, up from 25 in May, that, that select an international destination, either short or long haul, as the first trip that they would like to make. If you look at that in conjunction with the strong uh, willingness to travel over the October holiday or through the end of the year, the implication is that when green lanes, green bubbles, travel lanes, reciprocal travel lanes do start to become a thing between uh, mainland China and other geographies, there is certainly a latent demand here that we would expect to make full use of those lanes when they become available to travel. Um, as it says on here, Southeast Asia, South Korea, Europe, Russia uh, remain popular travel destinations, which is positive for our travelers or our, our clients that are located in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia as places that could potentially become travel bubbles for mainland Chinese travelers, outbound travelers. So if we move to the next page, I'll share one more insight around source of inspiration for travel. Um, we see two key trends here emerging when people, when we ask people, what was your inspiration for your most recent trip and what is going to be your inspiration for the next trip, which we've highlighted in blue in here. Of course, we know friends, family, TV shows have been a classic uh, inspiration for travel for many, many years. What was surprising is the, the growth in the lighter blue bars here. And when we double click into travel articles or comments, what is the source of those travel article or comment inspiration? For sure, online travel forums remain popular at 59%. Um, however, we now see key influencers or key customers starting to emerge as a key as a critical um, inspiration for travel globally, outbound travel for Chinese travelers. With 57% highlighting this as one of their inspirations. The second one we want to highlight here is Travel ads and promotions, of course, have been has long been a way of, dri of driving interest. Um, what's interesting now, though, is how the, the emergence of online streaming, as well as short-form video, TikTok, or Douyin, has started to change the way that people think about getting inspiration for their travel opportunities. Um, both of these are interesting trends to watch if you think about promoting new travel destinations as safe or effective, or trying to promote different forms of travel to customers as the travel trends and green lanes start to open back up again. So I'd like to pass it to Jackie to talk about a few more different insights uh, and where you could think about going with these surveys. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Will. Yeah, so we have briefly talked about um, the overall recovery situation in China, and we also covered uh, some of the selected key insights that we find out uh, from the latest uh, travel traveler sentiment survey. So I think the very interesting next question uh, will be about so what, right? So what would be the implications to uh, the uh, tourism players and broader um, uh, of the stakeholders in these uh, particular uh, sectors? Um, and we have been asking the same questions since the start of the um, um, the outbreak and also throughout the recovery um, um, uh, in China. Uh, and in April and May, we are, so what exactly the world can learn from China's uh, recovery lessons uh, experience. Uh, we see that some early commonalities around like the segment, uh, the order of return in terms of the segment, et cetera. Uh, but then because of the situation uh, around the travel and tourism recovery actually diverged quite a bit uh, globally in different markets. So every single market might have their very unique characteristics and uh, intrinsics. Um, so we see for some of the markets, the China lessons might be more applicable and relevant. For some others, maybe less uh, relevant and applicable. So um, we try to uh, categorize um, the, the markets into two big uh, categories in terms of the recovery strategies that would be more um, uh, useful and helpful to the different markets. For the first set of the markets, uh, we see that for the markets similar to China with a low uh, COVID-19 contraction rate and hence uh, probably will have a higher uh, traveler confidence level. Uh, for those markets, we, 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 we see uh, the zero case first um, uh, strategy is more profounding and applicable, meaning that um, the traveler sentiment is quite strong. The confidence level to go traveling again uh, is quite high. So for traveler players or for tourism players, the key focus in recovery would be to, to rebuild the demand and also enhance the value uh, uh, accordingly. And then for the other uh, part of the um, uh, strategy, that will be for the markets where the contraction rate of COVID-19, uh, which will be a little bit higher, uh, and the resulting level of anxiety around travel tend to be higher as well. And for uh, those markets, 
we believe the recovery focus at the stage uh, or at the, the current moment will be focused on rebuilding the confidence through the implementation of the health and safety measures. Right? So some of the examples of the markets that belongs to the different uh, 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 categories would be like, say, for example, for uh, Vietnam, New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, Singapore, that could be uh, fall into the category of the zero case first. But for some of the um, uh, Western uh, markets like in the U.S. or some markets in uh, Europe, then might fall into the balance and uh, manage a category more. So uh, we want to focus a little bit more around um, the zero case first category to talk about what will be some of the lessons we see uh, will be more applicable uh, to uh, these types of uh, a market. And there are four takeaways for traveler players in the zero case of first market that we think uh, can um, to consider and think about. First of all, we believe that the essence to um, rebuild the demand and then uh, enhance the, the value is to basically understand the micro segments uh, and the travel recovery patterns uh, for the particular um, market. And secondly, can we also find some of the interesting or emerging new uh, opportunities in terms of the domestic destinations of the new types of products that would uh, emerge uh, during the recovery uh, of the tourism uh, uh, practice. And then uh, the third one, as we also cover a little bit around the channel for inspiration, we see the digital channels uh, is actually quite uh, critical uh, and important uh, as one of the top channels for people to think about uh, the next uh, destinations or their next trips. So the digital marketing uh, inside the tourism uh, sectors, we believe that will be accelerated uh, because of the COVID situation. And finally, as we also mentioned before, the latent demand for outbound travel is actually quite strong as we observe in China. So how to reopen gradually in line with some of the travel bubbles or green lane, uh, uh, et cetera, um, where possible uh, will be something to think about. So I'm going to share with you uh, some of the deep dive for each of these points with some of the best practice um, uh, examples that we uh, see in China. So first of all, about the review demand and enhance uh, value. To talk about the demand, we believe that's very important to track the behavioral uh, patterns and also the recovery of China in phases. Um, and we try to understand these from three different dimensions. One is more from the demographics of the segments to understand which segments were first to resume or to, uh, to come back. And then secondly, will be around the destination or the products types that could uh, come back first. So by proximity of the destination or by uh, the different uh, product package, that will be more um, uh, popular for uh, the Chinese travelers. And then finally, uh, also around the trip format that we think uh, would also come back uh, in order, as we just uh, mentioned. So a little bit about the domestic, as um, uh, Will mentioned earlier, we see the young and single segments will come back first, and that's what happened. Uh, in the April uh, season uh, in China, when uh, that's the first uh, holiday uh, after the outbreak in the Qingming Festival, uh, we see may, mainly that would be the young and single segments. And then in the Labor Day uh, season, which will be in May and also during the summer season, we see the family uh, uh, segments actually come back quite uh, substantially, followed by a certain portion of the elderly population. And then in the uh, past uh, uh, a few weeks, we're already seeing basically all the age groups in general is coming back, including the more um, uh, older age uh, segments and also the uh, retired segments as well. And in terms of the proxim uh, proximity of the vaccinations, obviously within cities like the vacation types of trips are uh, actually gaining uh, quite a lot of the momentum there. And then also uh, in the golden week season or in the summer season, we see that around cities or some of the short haul uh, uh, get away to the nearby destinations uh, in the major uh, tier one and tier two cities becoming also very popular types of trips. And of course, for some of the uh, peak seasons, like the Golden Week, we see some of the domestic long haul uh, uh, destinations also come back quite a bit, and I will cover these uh, uh, in a second as well. And in terms of the trip formats, uh, of course, 
uh, very naturally, people are still have the fear uh, to get into a bigger crowd or to uh, travel with the strangers. So uh, some of the DIY uh, or the smaller group to uh, uh, road trips with your friends or direct families will be the one that come back first. And then to a more like a private group uh, uh, types of tour that you can still contain uh, the group size in a uh, reasonably uh, small and manageable uh, size. And then finally to the larger group and also maybe some of the format like cruising uh, can come back as well. And these will be more around the volume side. And then why we think uh, they will be the opportunity to enhance value, because we see the evidence, uh, for example, from the hotel uh, subsegments. If we look at the occupancy recovery patterns uh, in China, in the very latest uh, uh, number that we see in August and September, uh, the recovery uh, uh, percentage in terms of the luxury and the ultra high-end luxury tiers is actually much stronger or even stronger than the mainstream. Right, comparing with the mid-range uh, or budget hotel or maybe in the mid to upper high-end hotel, the really high-end, uh, the top-tier hotels, they actually uh, recover quite uh, strongly. So uh, the learnings here would be how you uh, make sure you can stay uh, top of my brand and then you can uh, have uniqueness to promote your brand story during this particular uh, season to basically draw uh, the demand uh, to your property or your brand would be something to think about. And the underlying drivers, we believe uh, that to support uh, these particular uh, phenomenon is because of the limitation of going internationally. So some of the substitution effect from the outbound travel, which originally would be uh, 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 supported by the middle class or more the higher end segment, uh, now because they, they are trapped domestically, they cannot go outside. So they would spend more domestically and which supports uh, substantially for these higher end types of products. And we see that uh, it's coming uh, quite um, um, significantly in the Golden Week season because even before the, um, um, the Golden Week, like two weeks before the Golden Week, we're already seeing that like for the boutique hotel or the high-end hotels in some uh, popular destinations like Hainan or like uh, Yunnan, both the occupancy uh, rate and also the average room night is already exceeding um, uh, uh, the 2019 uh, level. And the next point about the emerging destinations and new types of products. Uh, in terms of the emerging uh, destinations, we see a very clear uh, shift in terms of the destination choice. So when we ask the people uh, in 2019, uh, who, what would be the top 10 destinations in summer vacation? Uh, as you can see uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, the black trackers would be the top 10 um, uh, destinations. That's mainly the coastal uh, cities and some of the, the major uh, cities uh, surrounding uh, the tier one and tier two cities. But then if you look at the 2020 uh, summer season, uh, which would be the blue trackers here, we see that the middle and the western part of China, uh, especially the destinations with abundant outdoor or natural resources, uh, asset types of uh, destinations, say for example, some of the destinations in Yunnan, in Sichuan, and of course in Hainan as well, they're actually uh, getting much significant uh, share of the uh, uh, popularity. Uh, and the other caveat on these, uh, when we look at the new destination here, we generally uh, see that the infrastructure in terms of the transportation or the infrastructure in terms of the tourism facilities, in terms of number of hotels, they are traditionally underdeveloped. So these could also be a site of new uh, investment opportunity uh, for, um, uh, uh, for investors or for travel players to pay attention to. And of course, to do this uh, in a meaningful way uh, cannot be do it uh, uh, individually. Right? So we see that uh, some of the very strong um, uh, pickup of the uh, uh, new destinations, say for example in Hainan, in Sanya particularly, is actually a collective effort from the government, uh, from the travel players, from the channel players, etc., to make it work. Right? So in terms of the, uh, the policy uh, uh, relaxation, in terms of the allocation of the resources of the travel players, actually help a lot to make these uh, uh, things happen. And also in terms of some um, of the new product or service type that we also observe uh, during the um, 
uh, recovery in China. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we see that the substitution effect from the outbound tourism spending back to domestic. So on the left-hand side here uh, is a recent research analysis, basically to understand for each of the major uh, tourism markets in, uh, uh, in the world, if the outbound spending uh, return to uh, domestically and then subtracting or minus uh, uh, to, to take out the uh, inbound spending in, in travel, here will be the net uh, travel um, uh, spending that will be uh, flowing back to the domestic market. And you can see here, for example, China will benefit a lot uh, because uh, for the outbound spending that cannot uh, spend uh, overseas uh, in the uh, seasons of uh, the international restrictions, uh, we see all these will benefit a lot uh, domestically. But also for some of the uh, markets like Japan, uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, so some of these um, um, markets in Asia uh, having the outbound uh, or having the inbound source markets back will be quite uh, important and critical uh, to uh, recover the overall uh, tourism market. And because of these potential substitution effects, we also see some evidence of uh, emerging new types of products and also the new types of service. For example, travel retail is clearly one of the, the key signs here. Uh, as Valky earlier mentioned, uh, in the golden week, uh, we see the duty-free uh, sales uh, in Hainan particularly uh, increased like 40 to 50 percent comparing with the pre-crisis level. Uh, and this is largely benefited by uh, the relaxation of the duty-free policies in Hainan and also because of the latent demand for the travel retail uh, spending uh, is quite strong. And also for some of the traditional uh, 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 activities that people would do uh, overseas, like diving, skiing, or some of these outdoor niche types of uh, sports or adventurous uh, um, uh, products or surface, we see a strong rebound uh, in China particularly. For example, for diving, uh, we see in Hainan during some of the holiday seasons, uh, the booking is awful, uh, the price is even exceeding uh, the pre-crisis level, and skiing as well. So traditionally, Chinese people would like to go to Japan, uh, uh, Korea, or even in some of the uh, destinations in Europe to do skiing trips, but now uh, it's uh, basically all domestic. So we see even for some of the destinations uh, without uh, the natural snowing weather, uh, the indoor skiing uh, facilities or the products is very popular, Say for example, for uh, in Guangzhou, in Chengdu, in Chongqing, uh, uh, etc. And the next one about the uh, digital marketing uh, transformation. So as we mentioned, uh, because of the COVID uh, situation actually accelerate the entire penetration of the uh, e-commerce, uh, online uh, 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 commerce uh, as well. And particularly for the travel uh, sector, we see on the uh, sales channel and also the marketing channel, uh, the social uh, related uh, new platforms or channels uh, gaining a significant uh, momentum. Uh, here are three uh, interesting uh, observations uh, as a food of thought for you to consider. First of all, about the social media. Right? So we see that um, people uh, in China in general, so general uh, consumers in China, they spend like 20% more on their, uh, uh, um, on their mobile. And then uh, on average, people will have like nine to 10 different social media accounts uh, in China. And particularly during the COVID season, we see that people who use the show show content app uh, would be even um, uh, um, uh, more uh, popular than uh, the pre-crisis level. So that we see some of the uh, players in China uh, can actually uh, capture this opportunity by uh, switching some of their channel mix uh, from the traditional marketing channel uh, to some of these new channels, uh, doing some of the live streaming or live broadcasting types of the promotion. And the, the result is actually quite uh, significant. And we see that um, this is quite a, um, a positive experience for the consumer. And we believe uh, or expect these um, uh, behavior will stick uh, even even after the crisis. And secondly, about the uh, cloud traveling. So because uh, people cannot uh, get to the physical site uh, at an uh, early stage uh, of the uh, recovery, so we see that for some of the attractions or theme parks, they're actually uh, doing all these uh, um, online experience, moving uh, the journey or the customer experience journey uh, from uh, offline to online and extend the entire uh, experience even to uh, the uh, digital world. And we find it quite uh, uh, interesting interestingly uh, um, effective in terms of um, 
keeping or engaging with your potential customer and also keeping your brand on top of mind of your customers. And finally, uh, we also see a very interesting uh, uh, partnership uh, from uh, some of the uh, OTA platforms with some of the uh, internet giants, like the tech platform as a traffic portal. And especially because of the traveler behavior change uh, and moving a lot to online, we see that with this exclusive partnership that you can actually lock in uh, quite substantially your uh, potential customer segments. And, and that's why, uh, as we can see, uh, uh, the only profitable OTAs around the world uh, is in China. And, um, uh, and, and the one who can successfully uh, do it uh, would we'll have these very exclusive uh, partnership uh, with the, one of the largest uh, international uh, giants in, in China. And we see this not um, uh, only a unique case or a very special case in China, we also see that can be applicable uh, to other markets as well. And finally, around the outbound um, uh, Market. So we talk about the latent demand to Alban is quite strong, and we believe that uh, the essence for um, the overseas destinations to capture uh, the Chinese uh, inbound travelers uh, would actually um, uh, about two things. One is uh, the uh, uh, COVID-19 contraction rate um, control, right? So because the Chinese government in general is very prudent and conservative, so if you can match uh, the similar uh, contraction rate uh, uh, as of China, uh, you have the uh, tickets to, to talk about the, uh, the travel bubble uh, or the green lane uh, arrangement. But on the other hand, it's also very important to, um, uh, to build a mutual trust uh, between the two uh, sides uh, of the government in terms of the hygiene protocol and also uh, the, the pandemic control measures to make sure that the Chinese government will be uh, confident and uh, comfortable uh, to open uh, the market in um, uh, different forms of treatments. And to the travel companies, uh, on one hand, of course, you need to uh, monitor uh, the situation quite closely. And on the other hand, because of the hygiene and cleanliness uh, factors is particularly important. So how to make sure it's visible and then uh, you can keep the highest standard to make sure both your customers and also the government will be uh, comfortable uh, to open up uh, gradually. So uh, a few uh, closing thoughts uh, for these webinars. Um, so first of all, uh, we have faith and we believe that travel will be back. So based on the historical uh, patterns uh, and also the, the recent evidence in uh, multiple markets, we believe that travel will be back. Uh, and, um, uh, and China could be one of the very good uh, examples as the evidence to show that. Uh, of course, the, the recovery uh, journey may be ups and downs and not every pump can be doable. Uh, but then we believe that um, uh, travel uh, is uh, basically in the DNA of the uh, consumers. So when it's possible and feasible, uh, people will travel again. And secondly, uh, for the travel players, in terms of really to capture the opportunity and be prepared uh, uh, for the travel recovery, it's very critical to track and monitor uh, uh, the travel uh, patterns in terms of the segment, in terms of the products, in terms of the formats that we have uh, covered earlier. And uh, the third point, we believe uh, customer behavior will change uh, in the next normal world. Uh, it would be a function of the fourth behavior duration and also the satisfaction uh, of the new behavior or the new uh, operating model. So as a travel player, how to make sure it's not only safer uh, in terms of your new operating model, but also better uh, in your operating model can make the new behavior and new offering stick. So invest ahead in terms of the product, the destination, the channel, and also operating model, it would be quite critical to think uh, ahead. And then finally, uh, as we mentioned, travel uh, recovery is uh, a bit uncertain and also uh, uh, in general very unpredictable. So how to embrace the change and uh, have a very agile uh, organization set up and infrastructure to make sure you can uh, be um, uh, um, uh, agile enough and nimble to uh, react to the changes. Um, and finally, thank you very much for uh, uh, um, joining us today. Uh, we have the latest report just launched uh, uh, earlier this week. So uh, if you're interested uh, in our research, uh, please scan our QR code for uh, more uh, details about this report. So I'll uh, pass it back to uh, Steve uh, to guide us to throw towards the Q&A. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Valky, to Will, and to Jackie for running us through those findings. 
as Jackie said, the latest report is on McKinsey.com. You can go and it should be easy to find under travel, or please scan the QR code here and you can get access to the, the full report. We'd like to move now to the Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, the Q&A panel is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. All questions are anonymous. Um, please feel free to ask anything that you would like from the, from the panelists. We'll spend 10 minutes or so on Q&A, and there, there's, there's a couple of questions which have already come in, which I'll, which I'll start with. Um, but please do, do submit more. We will have time for some more questions. Um, first question is going to be to, I think it's probably to Jackie. Um, you talked about a series of trends or things you saw differently in the market. Um, which of those do we think are permanent changes versus sort of temporary shifts because of COVID-19 and will revert back to normal behavior? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we talk about a few uh, trends or changes we identify uh, in the recovery uh, in China, right? So um, on one hand, the digital uh, marketing channel. Uh, secondly, uh, the destination. And thirdly, I think some of the new uh, product um, uh, offerings or the service types. Uh, um, so I think, so back to my um, uh, earlier um, uh, point or perspective around what will stick, right? So uh, we believe that the uh, stickiness of the new behavior is a function of uh, the forced uh, behavior duration uh, times the satisfaction of the, uh, uh, the new operating model. And uh, as we, we apply these uh, uh, thinking uh, process to the three things that I just mentioned, I would believe the digital uh, digitalization acceleration uh, would stick, right? So both in terms of the, the traveler behavior preference and also in terms of the operating model from the uh, tourism players, we see that uh, both sides already have some benefit from that. Uh, for example, a stronger customer engagement, uh, easier uh, um, uh, a choice for, for the traveler to explore the products, et cetera. So we believe these would stick. Uh, in terms of the destination, that would be a, I would say, um, uh, in, in the middle of whether they would stay or not. The reason being, uh, we believe that without the outbound travel uh, restrictions uh, lifted, uh, people will still do domestic uh, travel uh, uh, mainly. Right? So the question would be, can the travel players can really excel? in serving the, uh, the new uh, uh, segments of uh, customers who have these very special windows that they will spend time uh, domestically. So can you come up with the product, the service model that can actually make them satisfied and then can stick with you? Uh, then, then that would be a very critical uh, question to, to answer. We believe that when um, the COVID-19 situation um, uh, is being resolved or the, uh, the outbound restrictions is lifted that people can go out again, some of the demand that we see today in the domestic travel will, of course, will flow back to uh, international. But the question is by uh, what magnitude, right? So that will largely depends on how uh, the travel players can uh, can create a loyalty and uh, to refine your value proposition uh, for uh, travel uh, for travelers in China. Um, and finally, I think in terms of the uh, products. Um, they, uh, that, that would be quite similar to the destination as well, I would say. Uh, and, uh, of course, if you can, uh, create the new behavior and stickiness during the recovery, uh, session, uh, the recovery, uh, uh, period, that would have a higher probability for these to stick. But in general, we also see that that could be a risk to think about if you, uh, don't over, uh, uh invest in some of the new trends, uh, with uh, 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 keep in mind that the, when the, uh, uh, the international restriction lifted, some of the demand will flow back to um, uh, overseas. Great. Um, thank you very much, Jackie. Second question we got in was about green lanes. I think, um, we talked a little bit about it, but um, how do we see these likely to be opening up from China to other countries? Um, will, would you like to take that? Sure. Thanks for the question, Steve. I think uh, green lanes are a very exciting development. This is, this is sort of green shoots of international travel in these green lanes, if you will. Um, the, the concept is not new. I think the first one opened back in June between Singapore and China, um, but of course has been very restricted in terms of who can go and the application process and the locations that you could travel to within China uh, within the first 14 days. However, now we see this, this starting to proliferate with yesterday's announcement between Singapore and Hong Kong. There's, of course, now Singapore, Korea. There's now a China as of this morning, China and Taiwan, or excuse me, Thailand. 
have an in-principle agreement uh, for goods and people move back and forth. So that, you know, the, I think the, I think our view is that these are going to continue to proliferate. They will start, of course, with very small restricted access, business travel, critical business travel, um, or critical travel only. There'll be a little bit of a lengthy process of, to go through the application to be able to do these things. I mean, these I think are best thought of as the test steps, the baby steps to see, does the process work? How do we iterate the process? How do we make this faster and ensure that it still remains safe? As governments gain confidence in these baby steps and the, uh, the, the restrictions that they're putting in place are not resulting in the reintroduction of new COVID cases, uh, then you would expect these green lanes to pretty quickly begin to proliferate. And then different green lanes starting to connect together into green bubbles, if you will, where you have multiple locations now or multiple countries with reciprocal travel agreements in place that allow um, more frictionless travel between uh, those countries. It will not probably uh, in the next three or four years go back to what it was before COVID. There are still gonna be various test on departure, test on arrival kinds of restrictions in place. However, the technology on the testing is also continuing to improve. So uh, between the technology innovation, as well as the pilots that are being put in place at the country level, we would expect that these green lane trends will continue to improve and accelerate and offer some real chances for, uh, for some of the pain that's been felt in international travel to start to go away. Thanks, Steve. Great, um, thank you very much. Um, next question um, is actually around the domestic air recovery. Um, and I'll take this question. Um, it was about, is this driven by improved sentiment um, regarding the safety of traveling? Um, or is it also driven by the low fares or increased flight capacity, um, which, may, which was potentially mandated? Very interesting. Um, what we're seeing here, um, first of all, the capacity is coming back and is coming back quickly. Um, that has been driven significantly, though, by the demand. Um, and remember here that the Chinese airlines have got a lot of spare planes. All the aircraft which used to be flying internationally are now not flying, and many of those are being redeployed domestically. Jackie shared with you earlier some of the, the, the markets which are booming, like Hainan. The wide body planes, which used to be flying internationally, can be redirected domestically on some of these high demand destinations. Airfares have come down. Um, the latest accurate data we've got is as of about July, the average airfares were down by 40% domestically in China. That was due, due to significant discounting and also some of the, the these kind of um, subscription-based products where you, can, where you can sign up and you get free flying for the rest of the year. They were great in stimulating prices, but they did drag down average yields. Since then, we've started to see airlines push the yields back up. And although they're still lower than this time last year in terms of ticket prices, that gap is closing. And remember that historically, the Chinese airlines were very profitable on the domestic. Like a typical Chinese airline made a lot of money on domestic travel and then lost it by flying internationally. At the moment, the international routes are practically closed for them, and so that loss which the airlines were suffering on the international route isn't present. And therefore, they've actually just got the domestic market. So the, the Chinese airlines are in okay health as we get towards the end of the, the end of the year. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of further questions here. Um, there's a good one around, interesting question around um, how are, we, we see the latent demand from Chinese travelers to travel internationally. Have we seen anything around how, in, how welcoming international markets are to Chinese travelers? Um, Jackie, do you want to take this? Yeah, so, yeah, so obviously um, there's very limited um, results or evidence at this moment, right? So uh, majority of the Chinese people cannot, uh, or, or in terms of the vaccination is not yet opened. And uh, even if it's open, then still need to, um, um, majority will be like the business traveler. Uh, but then um, from our recent discussions from, uh, with some of the overseas uh, tourism uh, clients, um, in general, the, the, the players or the uh, um, tourism players are well welcome um, uh, the Chinese traveler to back. Uh, obviously, because it's uh, one of the, the major uh, source market there. Uh, and also, I think uh, globally, uh, many of the um, uh, travel players are suffering uh, quite a lot. 
So uh, having the, um, the, the support uh, from one of the largest source market will be always welcoming. Uh, and also we see for some of the products, uh, for example, to, uh, to Thailand, there's already some of the uh, products that are happening, even uh, under the quarantine uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, from the evidence that we see from the public data, uh, the experience uh, overall is quite uh, positive, and also uh, the product is quite uh, popular as well. So uh, we see that at least uh, with the, the evidence here, uh, we, we, we believe that the, in terms of the supply side, it's very um, um, uh, welcoming uh, in terms of the, the Chinese uh, chocolate. Right. Great, thank you. And then uh, one last question, and I'll direct it to Will. Um, what are we seeing airlines' websites do? What are we seeing airlines do with their websites um, to promote travel and to help our customers through this crisis? Yeah, no, it's a, that's a super relevant question, Steve. I think uh, that this is also very timely as we think about both the recovery of domestic market in China and now potentially some international travel. Um, for a different, not featured on this particular uh, survey here, but for a different uh, set of clients, we had done some research around what's the sticking point and what's the pain point around booking travel and moving to the airport. Um, that uh, particular set of research was what, what customers don't have is clarity around what are the rules um, and then who do I, where do I even go to find out some of the answers to these questions? Uh, because the rules, of course, and then what's real changes very quickly, and customers don't know what the source of truth is for that. So one of the things that we've been um, discussing with many of our airline clients and even some of the travel agency and government clients, um, this is it's very important for the landing page to have some sort of FAQ or some sort of links to some of these sources of truth around what are the rules in place right now and what are the restrictions how do I go to the airport? What do I need to bring? What are the things, the kind of documents I need to have to prove that I've had the test in three days? Um, these are all new processes for people that have not, even if they've traveled extensively in the past, these are things that they don't know how to do yet. And they're still coming up the learning curve for. So to the extent that uh, airlines can help in reducing that anxiety in their promotions and in their booking pages, it will help convert um, perhaps browsers to purchasers, if it, can, if it becomes clear that there is not a lot of um, friction or a lot of anxiety to be had around this point, and it will help continue to pull people down the funnel, the sales funnel towards actual, uh, you know, in the seat, in the plane day of travel. Uh, that would be the place that I would start. Back over to you, Steve. Great. Um, thank you very much. We're, we're at time, so um, thank you very much again to Valky, to Jackie, and to Will. Thank you for joining. Um, there was a question around, are the charts available? We, if you fill out the survey with your information after the webinar, we'd be happy to share the charts. However, even better than the charts is the full report. Um, so take, scan this QR code or go to mckinsey.com and you'll be able to get access to all of this plus additional insights, which we didn't cover today. Thank you very much again. Um, please do stay subscribed to our lists and we'll uh, keep you updated on our future travel webinars. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.